Hey everyone, thanks for joining Learn to Play Games. My name is Lance, and in today's video, I want to take a look at a brand new game that just finished up on Kickstarter. That is Dungeon Saga Origins. This is a brand new one from Manic Games. It is a two to five player game that takes roughly 45 minutes to an hour and a half to play and is a one versus many game, which means that one player will be controlling the Overlord or Dungeon Master, controlling all the different enemies and revealing the map as the players explore it. The rest of the players will be playing heroes trying to make their way through the dungeon and meet the different objectives for whichever mission they've selected to go on. The game itself can be played in two ways. The players can play it as a single one mission where they can choose whichever mission they want to play and go ahead and play through it, or they can play it as a campaign which has additional benefits including where the players will be able to gain coins throughout their missions and then at the end of each mission they'll be able to go to the market or town or whatnot and purchase new items and equipment and all kinds of better gear that'll make their next dungeon adventure a little bit better or hopefully a little easier depending upon what you're able to pick up. So in this video, I'm going to take you through and show you the main features of this game, as well as show you some sample turns to give you a good idea how this one plays, so you can decide whether or not this is one you want to late pledge for after the Kickstarter late pledge gets launched. So as always, if you find my videos helpful, if you like what I do, please consider that like button and subscribe to my channel. It's one of these ways you can support channels like mine so we can continue to grow, be able to produce this content. If you want to get a notification anytime I drop new videos, also hit that notification bell and that'll let you know whenever I drop new stuff as I'm constantly dropping new videos including unboxings, playthroughs, Kickstarter coverage, and teaching videos for some of the latest games coming out there. I do also want to point out that all the materials you see here are still prototype materials and are subject to change and look a lot better in the final production copy of the game. So let's go ahead and head to the table. We'll see what this one's all about. The first thing I want to go over are the different hero characters that players can play as, as most of the players in the game will be playing heroes. Each one of them is going to have their own card that is going to list all the information for that hero, including that hero's name and the type of hero that it is. Down one side of the card is going to be the hero's health, and at the beginning of the game they'll start at the top, and then as they take damage they'll work their way down till the bottom, in which case that hero will be knocked out. On the other side are the hero's stats, including the hero's movement, or number of spaces it can move during its turn, its combat value, or number of dice it'll roll in combat. If it has a ranged attack, it'll list that there, along with the number of dice it rolls, and its defensive value. Each one of the characters is also going to have a special ability that they can use once per game. And then each character will also, or each hero, is going to have a feat, which is going to have a card that's going to be corresponding to that. And each character at the beginning of the game will get to choose what side of the card they want, with each side having a different feat that, again, can only be used once per game. Now, throughout the game, as if a hero is knocked out, then they each character or each hero is going to have a revive token that they will get to spend to bring their character back up to full health. Now, they, each character, hero only has one revive token, and once it is used, it is going to be flipped over and given to the overlord to be used as an interrupt token instead. Each character will also have its own miniature. And then throughout the game, characters will be able to gain new items, such as new equipment, including fine swords or great hammers, helms of battle, shields, and even legendary items, such as the runic breastplate. And each one of these will be listed which kind of characters can use them. And there are four main characters going to, that are going to be included in the game. The dwarf fighter, a human barbarian, a human wizard, and an elf ranger. On the other side, you'll have one player playing the Overlord, and this player is going to have access to two different types of monsters, the monster bosses and the minion monsters. Starting with the minion monsters, each one of them will have its own card that is going to list the name of that minion on the top, along with its image and the four different stats, including its combat value, movement, defense, and ranged combat value. Some minions are also going to have a special ability that will be listed here, and then at the bottom of the card you're going to have the damage target number, which is the number of damage points you must deal to that minion in one attack in order to eliminate it. If you're unable to do that, then that minion will stay on the board with no wounds on it. Moving over to the boss level minion or monsters, each one of them will have its own card that is going to work similarly to a hero level character. As you can see, they'll have a number of hit points that the heroes are going to have to deal to it in order to eliminate it. You'll have its four different stats on the side, and each one of the boss level monsters are going to have a special ability that will make them unique as well. 
At the beginning of the game, the Overlord player will select a quest for the players to go on, or if the players are going to be playing a campaign, then you'll play the next mission in that campaign. And the Overlord player will have access to this special map that is going to list all the different tiles that are going to be used for this mission, along with the objectives and the layout of that mission. Now, when the Overlord player is setting up, they're only going to set up the areas that the players can actually see, as you're going to have all kinds of different rooms that'll have closed doors, and the players will not know what's in those rooms so the overlord will not set those up until the players open that door and reveal what is going on in that room. The overlord player is also going to have to keep an eye on this as the players are going to be able to search and explore in different areas trying to find hidden rooms and passages and treasure and all kinds of other things that are only going to be listed on the mini board that the overlord player will have access to including things like traps where players are not going to know that there are traps there until they stumble into that space and then the overlord player will have to reveal that and handle that Throughout the game, as the players explore the different areas looking for treasure in hidden compartments, they're going to be drawing cards from the exploration deck. And this is going to have all kinds of different effects, including marauding monsters, which will have the overlord player spawning new monsters onto the board the players will have to deal with, different types of gold that the players will spend at the end of the game to purchase different equipment from merchants and whatnot that they find, potions that the players will be able to use to help them in battle or heal, among all kinds of other things, including empty chests or even other equipment the players will be able to use throughout the game. All right, at this point, the last thing I want to do is take you through a sample turn and show you how combat works and some of the other features of the game. Now, I do want to point out at this point that during the Kickstarter campaign, the funding went very well and they were able to unlock an app. So for those of you that are looking for a solo experience or just want to play the game fully cooperative without an Overlord player, the app will allow you to do that and everything will be controlled by the app being able to reveal the different dungeon and the enemies will be controlled and all that by the app. So that's depending on, you know, that depends on how you like to play the game. Some players do not like apps. So if you don't like that, of course you can play with an Overlord player and that player will handle all of that. For this, I am also going to have the map card or map out so that I can reference it. But normally this is going to be kept hidden from the players and the Overlord will be the only one that has access to that. From here, moving into the game, the game is going to be played over a number of rounds. During each round, each one of the hero players will get to activate their hero, and during a player's activation, they will be able to do two different things. They may choose to move if they want to, and then they can perform one action with their hero, which can be a variety of different things, including exploring or trading, being able to attack enemies if they're within range, and a number of other features, also depending upon the dungeon and the objectives you're taking for that mission. So from there, after all the players have gone, then the Overlord player will get to go, activating some or all of the monsters that are out on the board, any that that player chooses. Now, in between each player's turn, you do want to pause, as the Overlord player will have an opportunity to play an Interrupt token. And the, inter the Overlord player only has four of these at the beginning of the game, so it's going to be one of those things that doesn't happen very often, but at critical times when the Overlord player feels that it's really important to be able to do that, the Overlord player can play one of those tokens that will allow him to or her to activate an enemy outside of the normal turn sequence for the Overlord player. Now, the Overlord player will have opportunities to gain more of these tokens throughout the game by knocking players out, as each player will have that revive token, and when they use it, they're going to flip it over and then hand it to the Overlord player to become an interrupt token. So the more characters that the Overlord is able to knock out, the more light, more of the interrupt tokens that, that Overlord will have access to. So from there, let's go ahead and jump into it. So during the, the hero player's turns, the players will collectively get to choose who activates first. You can do this in any order you want to. I'm going to go ahead and activate my Elf Ranger first, as she has a really good amount of movement that'll get her into a good position where I, I could probably snipe one of these different uh, skeletal warriors and get them out of the way. So I'm going to go ahead and activate her first, and during her activation, she can either move first and then perform an action, or perform an action and then move, but she won't be able to split that up. So if she does some of her movement, she cannot perform an action and then continue the rest of her movement. So she has a movement of six, so she's gonna move one, two, three, four, five, and I'm gonna go ahead and hold off there, and then I'm gonna go ahead and perform my action, which is a ranged attack as she has that ability. I'm gonna go ahead and fire onto this skeleton here, 
And in order to determine if you have line of sight, you're just going to draw a straight line from anywhere on your square to any point on your enemy's square. And as long as you're not intersecting anything, then you have line of sight. There will be certain features out there such as desks or different things that will either block line of sight or provide cover for the other, for your opponent, whoever you're shooting at or if they're shooting at you. So that is also something which will reduce your accuracy or number of dice that you're going to roll. So from there, then I'm going to go ahead and attack. So with my character, she is going to get four blue dice as her ranged attack ability is four. And then the skeletal warrior will roll his attack, which is two. Now, there are subtraction or minuses to this, such as if you're in the rear of your target. So for example, if she was shooting at this skeletal warrior, she would actually reduce his defense by, or his number of dice that he rolls by one to a minimum of two. So at this point, there's no point necessarily reducing this anymore. Uh, otherwise, if you do after that, then it'll actually start coming off of your target's defensive value way up until a minimum of one. So you can never go below one on the defense as well. So he's going to roll two dice for his combat value. She's going to roll four. And let's see what happens. Okay, so then we're going to... Well, that's cracked. Let me roll that over. Okay, then we're going to compare all of the values on the dice that the hero rolls to the enemy's defense. Any die that is less than or equal to that is eliminated as the enemy's armor basically soaked that up. From there, then you're going to compare the rest of the dice values with the highest first, followed by the next, and so on and so forth. Each one that the hero has higher than the enemy's is going to score a hit and do wounds. Each one that is equal to or less than the enemies will not score a hit and is going to be eliminated. So for example, with this first one, if my or if the enemy had rolled a five, then the enemy would have eliminated that and no damage would have been done. But then this one would do a damage and that one would also do a damage as there's no dice left for the enemy to, to cover those. So in total, I would have done two wounds and the skeletal archer's damage target value is two. So that would have been enough to eliminate that guy and I would have just removed him from the board. So from there, then that would conclude my hero's turn. And again, at this point, I would pause, letting the Overlord have an opportunity to use an interrupt if the Overlord wished. At this point, the Overlord's not going to do that. So then it would go back to my characters to go. So at this point, with the Elf Archer going, her turn is completely done. So all that we have left is the Dwarf, the Human, and the Wizard. So I'm going to go ahead and go with my Human Fighter or my Human Barbarian next. And he has a movement of five. So I'm going to go one, two, three, four. And I'll go ahead and go there. And I'm going to go ahead and attack the skeletal warrior there. So he has a, a melee attack of five. And the skeletal archer is at minus one because he has multiple heroes that are, he's outnumbered at this point. So again, you can't reduce his dice below two. So his dice are going to stay the same, but his defensive value is going to drop to a one at this point. And that's as far down as it can go. From there again, we're going to roll our dice. Oof. So not very good. I lose two there, but I did keep that one, which normally otherwise I would have lost. And then we're going to compare the remaining results. So I do beat the first die. So that's a wound. But the second die, uh, the enemies, is higher than mine. So then that enemy is going to soak that one. And then I have one additional one that gets through, doing two damage, again, which will eliminate that enemy. So from there, then that is the end of my Barbarian's turn. So then it would move back over where the Overlord could interrupt. He doesn't have any enemies out at this point, so there's really no point in that. And I'll go back to my character's turns. So let's go ahead and go with the Wizard next. And I'm going to go one, two, three, four and five. Now at this point there are no enemies to fight and the wizard isn't next to anything but I can explore the corridor looking for hidden or secret passages or treasure. So at this point I'm going to go ahead and say that I'm going to explore which I'm letting the overlord player know then the overlord player is going to look on the map and see if there is anything that is hidden at this point which there is not so he's just going to say go ahead and draw an exploration card for treasure. 
So I'll draw that and resolve it. So I found a haste potion. So the hero may retain this card and use it at the end of their turn. When used, the card is discarded and the hero immediately makes another move. They may not take a second action, however. So this basically gives the character an extra move action, which would be pretty good, which I could use right now. And I could use that to go and open that door if I wanted to. But I think I'm going to go ahead and hold off there and hold on to it for a later use where it could be more useful. At this point, again, I would let the Overlord player know, and then I would move over to the Dwarf, who has the lowest movement value of only four, so he's just going to kind of move on up there with the rest of them and get ready for the next turn. Then, at this point, the heroes have gone, and it's the Overlord's player's turn. And unfortunately, he doesn't have any enemies out at this point, so his turn is going to go really quick, and it would basically pass back into a new round for the players, starting with the heroes again, where they're going to start making their way through the dungeon. Now, the important thing, like I said, you can explore different things, revealing certain stuff. So let's go ahead and say that as our heroes had made their way through, they made it into this room and my barbarian was in here and there are no enemies. And that's an important thing. If you wish to do an explore action, you must have no enemies either in the room you're looking in or if you're in a corridor visible to you and then you can take that action. So at this point, let's go ahead and say that my barbarian did a explore action. There is a hidden room in here or a hidden passage. So my, or the overlord would reveal that. And then the overlord is going to have the player roll a die. On a two through six, nothing is going to happen. But if the player rolls a one, something bad has happened and they found a monster or some trap or all kinds of different things, depending upon the mission you're playing. And then you'd have to resolve that. And then you can continue on. So this is how the, play, the, the game is going to be played out as the players are going to be moving around the board. The Overlord player will be able to activate enemies and hopefully try to slow down and stop the heroes from making it too far. The heroes don't have a ton of hit points and if a hero ever has all their hit points eliminated, moving it all the way down to the bottom, that hero is going to be knocked out. At the beginning of that hero's next activation, they must spend their token, if they have one, to come back in, which is going to fully heal them. And then they're going to have to pass for the rest of their turn. They won't be able to move or take any actions that turn. If a hero is eliminated or knocked out again and they don't have that token, then they are going to be eliminated from this mission and will be out for the remainder of it. And the rest of the players will hopefully have to make it on without them. Well, I hope you found this video helpful in deciding whether or not this is one you want to back or lay pledge for. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please post those in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Or swing by the Kickstarter's main page and drop any questions you have in the comment section as well. I'm sure the creators would love to hear from you and are more than happy to answer any questions you have as well. Until next time, I'll see you later.